<laughs> it's right. Awesome. Well, it is. You know, and I think that's the thing that I never want to take for granted. You know, I never want to take that for granted. And I think when we're up and we're speaking in front of people and we're sharing, we're sharing that relationship and we're sharing Christ with people, we get that little flutter in our belly. Amen. You know, our heart does pound. That we have to take a deep breath to kind of slow things down. I still do it. It still happens to me too. You know, that's awesome. Let me go ahead and pray before I go any further. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you when, that, when I, my hair stands up on my arms, when I get that little flutter in my belly, when my heart starts pounding. When your presence come over me, you let me know that you're here. That 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 you're not an idea, but you're an experience. Mm -hmm. And when I get to focus on you, when, when, when I get to blot out life and the distractions get put away, when that time that I sit down with you, when that time I get to share you, that your presence, I know you're around. Mm -hmm. Father, when we all gather here together, it was clear that you're here. So I pray, Father, that each one of us tonight, whatever thing that we're going through, whatever distraction comes over us, whatever junk we carried into this church tonight, that we leave it here tonight. Mm -hmm. Father, and let, one of my, let my brothers and sisters know that tonight, tonight the church came into the building. So I just thank you, Lord, and I pray that the words come out of my mouth are the right words, they're the correct words, and they're your words. They're not Will's words. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, right? Amen, 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 amen. I, uh, I've been preaching a lot lately. <laughs> Uh, no, no. Oak Hill, we were down Oak Hill last night. I got to share a message on Oak Hill last night. And it was funny because my message, so a couple of us, Steve, Mike, and Kevin, we went to this training on, uh, what day was that? Wednesday. Wednesday we went to this training, and it was a nice training, but it was, you know, the facilitator wanted us to share our testimonies. You know, and he gave us a little time to sit down and write our testimonies. Steve, Mike, and Kevin are sitting down, and they're writing and writing. And I was working on my message for yesterday. <laughs> but it was funny. I mean, it wasn't funny, but it was good. Kevin goes up there, man, he hammered him with God. Clearly knew where we were coming from. Mike followed suit. Hammered him with God. And then I sit down, and Mike looks beside me and goes, How are you going to go next? I was like, bro, I don't have to. You two made the point already, <laughs> you know. But I really like because at the end, I mean, it was a secular meeting, you know. At the end, the, the, the facilitators just kind of like threw their hands up in the air and they're like, man, we love Jesus too, <laughs> you know, at the end of the meeting, you know. But we went there on a mission. Steve and I were talking about that. I mean, there was a purpose that Recovery Church was invited to this training. And I believe the four of us, we fulfilled that mission that day. You know? But I was working on this message, and I had three messages going. And, you know, this past week at the jail, I was uh, digging through this book because I get the honor of sharing this resource to. Diesel. There you go. I get the honor of sharing this resource with the men in the jail. And one of the most important chapters the entire book one of the, the biggest things that you can read and understand and comprehend is in the very back in that spiritual experience on page 567 that is the purpose of this resource the purpose of this resource is that spiritual experience that you will have as a result of these steps and in this spiritual experience on 568 you know, what I learned, too, in my studies and that words are bold 
But words are italicized, there's a reason. The author's trying to emphasize this point. And in 568, Bill and Bob write that willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness are the essentials of recovery. But these are indispensable. Willingness, honesty, and open-mindedness. I got this one guy I've been working with. He's an old-timer, been in other rooms for many years. And he runs around, and him and I kind of like tag team the newbies. And he runs around, and he goes, that's how you do it. Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. That's the how, you know? But that's like his thing. He goes around and says, how, 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 how. And I love it. You know, it's funny. But that is honesty, open-minded, and willingness. But tonight, I'm not going to drag you through all three, I promise. We want to focus on one. I want to focus on the W. I want to focus on willingness. If you've been listening to any of these messages, if you've been following Recovery Church, you understand that this word, this idea, this concept of willingness has been on our hearts. It has been something that, man, I wish I could teach it to you. I wish that you could open a YouTube video, find some big doctor with a bunch of letters and numbers after his name to signify how many degrees and certifications he has. I wish you could watch that video, be able to understand, comprehend that video, and you would have willingness. I wish you could go to a church and listen to a rock star pastor get this knock em dead message and you would leave there with willingness. Not that simple, though. Willingness is not that simple. But it's indispensable. See, when I came in the rooms, though, Jeff told me, he would say, Will, if you don't know what a word means, you have to define it. So that instruction that Jeff gave me, I continued that instruction all through seminary, all through my studies, even now when I'm preparing a message. When a word comes out that I want to speak upon, that God has put a word on my heart, I need to define it. So I went in and I looked about this word willingness, and I looked up this word indispensable. Willingness means the quality or the state of being prepared to do something. Readiness, right? Willingness means you're prepared, you're ready to go, you're ready to do something. This next word, indispensable, was interesting because it's only defined by two words. Indispensable means absolutely necessary. So what the author is saying is that willingness, this readiness to do something, you're prepared to respond to a situation, you have to be absolutely, it's absolutely necessary to do it. <laughs> I found it something, because even going through this book and understanding this book, you get to step six of this book, that first real promise, it's in that step. And it says right there at the beginning that we have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Right there, before we're going to have God and ask him to remove all these defects of characters that we spent time writing down, all of these sins that we spent time writing down, this, this template for repentance, that's all this is. We don't have to compliment it or complicate it. It's just a template for repentance. But after we write down all of these things that we want to repent and ask God to remove from us, we still have to understand the concept that willingness is indispensable. I, uh, man, I'm excited. We got this beach baptism going. I'm super excited. I don't know, it's always been on my heart when we launched this ministry that we need to take these secular holidays and kind of rename them and redo different things on them. So I thought, what better than Memorial Day weekend? We're going to have a beach baptism cookout. All right? But I'm pumped. Man, I made that logo. That logo, where's the logo? The logo's pretty cool. You know? Right? Look at that! Is that you, Drew? You're sneaky. <laughs> There's the logo, though. You know? That's pretty slick. That's pretty slick. You know? I mean, that's super cool. You know? 
I got some t-shirts, some tank tops made with that logo on. We're going to get them rolled out. But I've been, so I've been studying John and I've been studying about baptism, what it means to be baptized and what, what, how John baptized Jesus and how he felt unworthy. So I'm reading John and uh, I'm reading John with this concept of willingness, right? It, it just, I'm stuck on it. And the first part I really get to is this Samaritan woman. Now listen, you've heard this a thousand times. I preached about this here a couple months ago. You know, you know the story about Jesus. and He was in this early Judean ministry. It was part, you know, his early years. But he goes to Samaria when he's not supposed to go. But he knows he had to go to interact with this woman. And, uh, you know, that infamous verses in verse 4 I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. Right. But I like after, and I hear, now follow me on this journey. She says, Sir... Give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Right after Jesus had this conversation with her, this is her immediate response. Now you might know what happens. You know, it says in 28, you know, the woman left. She went and told everybody in the town that, you know, I heard the Messiah's coming. This guy kind of told me a lot of things. It can possibly be him goes a little further, right? In 39, it says, you know, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because what the woman said and what she testified. Her interaction with Jesus led to a whole town of unbelievers coming to Christ and identifying that he was the Messiah. But I read a little further in John, and after that, see, there was interaction that Jesus had with this official son. It says he went to Cana of Galilee where he had turned water into wine. Jesus was already there. So this official knew he heard of Jesus. And when he came back, the official went to him and pleaded with him to come down and heal his son. For he was about to die. A little further, Jesus told him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But the official again said, sir... Come down before my boy dies. Goes a little further to find out from one of the slaves that were working that his boy was alive. And his boy came back to life at the exact time that Jesus said that he would. And then there's another. See, after that, there's a little gap, but there's another story after that about this Jewish festival, right? There's a Jewish festival that took place, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is in chapter 5. And there was a pool. I don't know, maybe like a swimming pool. I don't know, community pool. But there's a place that all these people were kind of hanging out and chilling at. These people were hanging out, and they're chilling there. These are the people who are sick, right? These are the people... It says, within these lay multitude of sick, blind, lame, and paralyzed. See, these people are waiting at this pole, because in this pole, the angels will come down, they will stir up the pole, and then the bodies of these people who are sick and hurting will go into the water, and they were healed. When Jesus showed up. And there was one man who had been sick for 38 years. Jesus walked up to this man, and he said... What are you waiting for? You're in the right spot. Hop in the pool. And the man said, Sir, I don't have a man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. While I'm coming, someone goes down there ahead of me. He can't make it. Jesus says, Get up. Pick up your bedroll and walk. Instantly. Instantly. The man got well 
picked up his bedroll and started to walk. So Jesus kind of fell out a little bit, took a step back. He let some things play out with the man and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the meet the man. And Jesus came back in to meet the man a little later. And in verse 14, after this, Jesus found him in the temple complex and said to him, see, you are well. Don't sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you. The man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And I'm sitting here and I'm reading that and this thought just comes into my mind. Now listen, don't judge me, just hear me out. Just hear me out. It says the only thing that God can't do is change your mind. The only thing God can't do is change your mind. The only thing God can't do is make you be willing. Don't judge me. Okay, I see a couple faces. I see him getting ready to contradict me, argue me. Just hear me out. Let's go back to 415. When this Samaritan woman, she said, Sir, give me the water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Let's go a little further. And the official's son, the official came down to heal his son for he was about to die. He pleaded with Jesus. Sir, the official said to him, come down before my boy dies. And even that man sitting there that well, getting ready to fall in. He asked him if he wanted to get well. And the man said, I can't get in the pool. I think about our lives, willingness. We have to make that decision. Jesus is right here in front of your face waiting to heal you, but you need to accept him and reach your hand out and let him in. It's the same thing, just that happened with three people right in a row. You have to be willing. That woman had to say to Jesus, please, I am thirsty, give me a drink. And as soon as she was ready to accept him, he did. That official said, please, heal my son. Please, I beg of you to heal my son. And as soon as he asked for Christ, Christ delivered at that very moment. And as soon as that sick man who couldn't fall in that pool of water asked for Christ for help, he could have been walking. He got up and walked. <clears throat> when you come into church, you come here, at least in the recovery church, there is a reason you are here. Something. Whether you want to serve, whether you still got some addictions that you're struggling with, whether you still got some resentment, some fear, whether you got that four-step inventory holding you down, there's a reason you are coming here. You're searching for something. It can end now, but you have to be willing to let it go. You have to be willing to surrender it. When we get together and we pray at the end, we are here waiting in the lips to heal you, to lay hands on you, to pray over you. But if you're not willing to let it go, it ain't, you know what I mean? It ain't going to... Keep on coming back. Uh, maybe that's where that comes from. <laughs> keep on coming back. Keep on coming back wasn't enough for me. I didn't want to keep on coming back. I wanted to be healed with that thing that I was struggling with. I wanted to let that thing go. I wanted to move on with my life and then come back to show people how I did it. That's why we're standing here in this room. That's why we got a pretty serious leadership team. That's why we got people that are willing to drive an hour away on the middle of the week to go down there and spread the solution to other people. That's why the people are willing to go out of their way and have a kiss ministry because people are tired of being sick and tired. I, uh, there is an awesome story. See, I've, I just explained this, you know, a little earlier to a fellow. 
You know, the first 103 pages of this book are the actual steps. First 103 pages are actually steps 1 through 12. After that, there's four chapters to whom it may concern chapters. To the wives, to the employers, to the family afterward, and then there's the vision for you. After that, there's 42 personal stories, right? Dr. Bob's Nightmare heads it off on page 171. Throughout the different editions, throughout the different years, the first 103 have never changed. They added the four to whom it may concern. In every edition, they might change and put another new story in there. But there's one story that I was reading today about this girl. She's titled, I, I researched her name, I couldn't find out who her name was, but her name of her story is My Chance to Live. She starts out her story on 309 and says she came through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous at age 17. A walking contradiction. On the outside, she was a portrait of a rebellious teenager with miles of attitude to spare. On the inside, she was suicidal, bloody, and beaten. She goes through her stories and how she's blackouts were her goal. Several attempts at suicide. She said that every morning she would wake up with a new resolve to stay sober. With few exceptions, by noon she was so messed up she couldn't even tell you her name. She said that the voices in her head became even more and more vicious. With every failed attempt, my head said, See, you failed again. You knew you wouldn't feel better, you're a loser. You're never going to beat this. Why are you even trying? Just drink until you're dead. She says a little further that her, it was never my intention to end up in AA. If someone mentioned perhaps I drank too much, I laughed at them. I didn't drink any more than my friends. I never got drunk when I didn't want to. Never mind that I always wanted to. I couldn't be an alcoholic. I was too young. Life was my problem. Other substances were my problem. She goes and she says a little page, a couple pages later, it took me about three months for me to realize that my problem in drinking made my problem much worse. And that other substances were simply tools to control my drinking. Man, when I read her story, felt I could immediately attach to that. I could connect to that. She goes in 316 is something that I thought was profound. She says, when I found myself at the bottom of a canyon thinking I'd never see the sun again, AA didn't pull me out of that hole. It gave me the tools to construct the ladder with the 12 steps. You know, it's not because you drink and drug. It's because you think you can drink and drug. We have to address the mindset. That's the issue, right? We can have all the tools in the world, but if we don't know how to apply those tools to our life, we're never gonna be able to climb that ladder and step out of that canyon. That's what she's saying. Man, I read that Bible front and back twice in my life, in my addiction. I can understand it, but I didn't know how to comprehend it. I didn't know the application of it. I was standing in my own way. I had to learn how to get myself out of the way that way I could apply what Christ was saying. I could learn who he is. I could feel his presence in me. I, I done, until I learned how to apply what that Bible said, on 3.17, she states, if asked what are the two most important things in recovery are, I would have to say willingness and action. Willingness and action. She goes a little further and she says, when I'm willing to do the right thing and rewarded with an inner peace no amount of liquor could ever provide. When I'm unwilling to do the right thing, I become restless, irritable, and discontent. It's always my choice. 
Through the 12 steps, I have been granted a gift of choice. I'm no longer at the mercy of a disease. It tells me the only answer is to drink. If willingness is the key to unlock the gates of hell, it is action that opens those doors so that we may walk freely among the living. Over the course of my sobriety, I've experienced many opportunities to grow. I've had struggles and achievements. Through it all, I have not had to take a drink, nor have I ever been alone. Willingness and action have seen me through it all. With all the guidance of a loving higher power and the fellowship of the program. Willingness is indispensable. It's absolutely necessary, and it can't be taught. It can't be watched on a YouTube channel. You have to be willing to go through whatever you have to go through. You know, I, another, another little, a, a, was that a, Geographical cure. I think we've all tried that. I moved a thousand miles away to try that. And I was here a month. You know, right back at it. Change your people, places, and things, they tell you. Well, too bad because you take you wherever you go. You know? <laughs> Until you are willing, until you change you, until you address the real problem, you're never going to get past it. I, uh, I heard a guy tell me one time that, you know, about this global positioning system, right? GPS. That self guided global positioning system. It needs to be changed to God positioning system. A real GPS. Right? I think about that. That woman at the well. That official pleading to heal his son. These people's state of readiness was absolutely necessary. And the biggest monumental task of it is you have to overcome yourself. You know, in, uh, in her story, her chance to live, at the end of her story, she has some promises. She says that life has not heaped monetary riches upon my head, nor have I achieved fame in the eyes of the world. My blessings cannot be measured in those terms. No amount of money or fame could equal what has been given to me. Today I can walk down any street, anywhere, without the fear of meeting someone I have harmed. Today my thoughts are not consumed with the craving for the next drink or the regret for the damage I did on the last drunk. Today I reside among the living, no better, no worse than any of God's children. Today I look in the mirror when putting on my makeup and smile, rather than shy away from it looking at myself in the eye. Today I fit in my skin. I am at peace with myself and the world around me. Tommy opened up in a prayer. Deliver us from evil. I think our prayer tonight needs to be deliver us from ego. Amen. Ego. Ready, Mark? You want to write it down? Ready? Edging God out. Yeah, me and Mark are acting buddies, okay? <laughs> deliver us from ego. Deliver us from ourselves. Get out of the way and be willing to accept this healing. If you are struggling with something, if you are hurting with something, whatever brought you through that door tonight, tell that thing that you're not going to pick it up on the way out. Tell that thing that it needs to get out of your way. And you are willing to do anything for it. 
Let tonight be that night. Let tonight be that night, your first night of permanent sobriety. Sure thing. Come on, Jim, you're doing communion too. <laughs> I just feel like I need to share this. Um, I meet with some ladies once a week on Saturday morning. We do a Bible study. We've been studying about women in the Bible, and it's a life application study, so we take their lessons and we apply them to our lives. There's one woman in the group, and she's been coming for several years and, you know, really growing and really learning. And one Saturday morning, she said, I want to share something. She said, I believe I have a drinking problem. And she had never shared that before. And she had struggled with it on her own. And she started to see that it was a problem in her life. And she could see because it was interfering with what she called her time management. Because when she got overwhelmed with her life in the evening, particularly, she would just take a drink and she would kind of just calm down. And, but then things piled up and it got worse. So she said, would you all pray with me? And I felt like for her, she had to humble herself and admit to a group of people and ask for their help. And I think that's so important. You know, we have people here that will pray with us and pray for us. And I just believe so strongly that the power of prayer, people praying with you and for you, is more than just you praying for yourself. And I think we have to be willing to lay it out, whatever it is, whatever we're struggling with. If it's anger, I struggle with anger. If I struggle with whatever it is, to just be open and say, will you pray with me? And then you can have people support you. And God hears those prayers. And I know when there's a group of people praying for us, it means so much more. So I just want to encourage everybody to, to be open and be willing. And don't be ashamed. You know, we all come with baggage. But if you're willing to let it go and lay it down and help people support you and pray with you, things happen. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Amen. Can I hear it for me? I don't know. <laughs> I'm talking about being nervous. <clears throat> Brother Mickey used to tell us, he said, if you're nervous, you're going to be honest. I've been at it a while, and I'm always nervous every time I get up here. The problem I have is usually I got all these notes and everything, and then when I get up here, they, they, it's like they're not there anymore. It's so bad. I want to share a little bit on on why we remember. Now what's the, you know, communion is about remembering, and if you look at it on the spiritual side. You can see it, but I think also we can look at it in reality on what's going on in us right now. And I was watching a guy last night, Jen and I was, and uh, he was talking out of the book of Daniel. And he was talking about old Nebuchadnezzar, the, the king, and he had this golden idol and everybody had to worship this idol. If you didn't worship it, it was going to kill you. Well, these three Hebrew men, they, uh, they told him, we ain't going to do that. You know, we worship our God. We don't worship gold. So Nebuchadnezzar, he said, well, we're just going to throw you in the burning furnace of the fire. He even told him, he said, I want to heat it up seven times hotter than it usually is. He was going to make sure. So they threw him in there. The fire was so hot that it burnt the, the guards that threw him in there. They got burnt so bad they died. Mm -hmm. Old Nebuchadnezzar, he was standing there watching them, you know, and he, all of a sudden he told one of his buddies, he said, I thought we put three people in there. 
He says, how come there's four? And somebody told him, he said, that looks like the Son of God. So Jesus was in there with them to comfort them, to help them, and he got them out. And we got a friend of ours. He's in a hospital. Mark talked about him. But he's not in there by himself. Right. Jesus is in there with him. And these stories in the Bible are for us to remember who Jesus Christ is and what he does. Daily in our lives. You know, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, he says, you are in me as I am in the Father and I am also in you. What does that mean? It means he's in us. He walks with us moment by moment. If we're willing to believe it. It's up to us to believe what Jesus Christ says, what the Holy Spirit tells us, what other people share with us. But are we willing to believe it? Right. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, it ain't rocket science. Read the Bible. It's all right there. But are we willing to believe it? In the book of John, Jesus was the first to to minister communion at the Last Supper. And he didn't make a great big deal out of it. He just said, remember me. And I talked before about it. He is the word. And when he said, when you eat, take this flesh, eat my body, you're taking the word in you. And when you drink the juice, you're accepting the salvation that I've given you. Amen. Believe it. Be willing to believe it. He laid it all out there for us. Remember, Jesus walks with us every day. If we accept it, remember it. I never did uh, I never really got into communion a lot. I remember as a kid, we used to take it, and I always thought it was kind of, I don't know. But when Will started asking me if I would do communion, I had to start doing some looking and seeing what communion really meant. Remember me. We don't have to just remember that he died. We've got to remember that he ra raised up. He got out of there and come up. And he said, I'm going to go send the Holy Spirit to you. That's what he did. Amen. He's going to send, he sent the comforter to us to guide and lead us. To give us the peace and the joy that he promised you <laughs> while he was here. Remember. There's a lot of days I don't remember. But I can remember back when I was running goofy. How the times that I got out of things that I shouldn't have never got out of alive. And I can look back on that. Jesus was there. Amen. We knew a woman down there in Okeechobee that she was a great counselor. And you go to her with a problem and tell her, tell her this is what, where I was and this is what happened. The first thing she'll ask you is, where was Jesus? He was there, but did you recognize him? Did you 
this evening. If we could ever, me and probably a lot of the rest of us, could ever really get our head wrapped around how much God loves us. When we begin to believe that, when we really believe that, then we're free to love others. And then we're satisfied in the great commission. To love God and to love others the way he loves us. Can't read this thing, I don't like it. I won't do it out of Mark, out of Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and as they were seating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Hey, eat, this is my body. he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying <clears throat> drink from it all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sin or salvation Father I thank you so much Thank you so much for the privilege of being able to share your word. Being able to realize how much you really do love us. And not just what you've done, but what you do daily. We're willing to look at it. And if we're willing to believe it. Thank you for recovering. I thank you that you've got us all redeemed. Amen. That the new covenant says that we're saved. Your blood is our salvation. Help us, Lord. Help us to believe it. And to walk in that newness of life that you promised. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen.